How are we doing? Hello, hello, hey guys. hello. Thank you all for being here early, especially if you saw the film last night. Actually, how many people saw the film last night first? Like, okay, good. We're gonna keep it as spoiler-free as possible so that all of you can see it when it comes out on April 5th, but Dev, welcome, sir. Um, I, I kind of stress to say this right now because I did see you last night and I know it was a moment, but what was it like to have that moment last night in the Paramount Theater? Because I know it was emotional, but also so satisfying. Yeah, I, I want to apologize for my voice right now. I, I'm, I'm not fit for public consumption. I've, I've been up for like, I've only had like 30 minutes sleep. Um, I'm functioning on uh, Red Bull and truffle fries right now. But um, uh, it was, um, it was truly humbling, um, the way whoever turned up, you know, just going in and being a man that's perpetually, you know, has low self-esteem to see that many people turn up and, you know, pinch yourself and slap yourself to just be like, you know, we, this film was not going to see the light of day, you know, a few months ago, and now we're here and people are queuing up and I just felt um, a lot of love and, 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 and joy in that room and, and I, it, it meant the world, it really did. Yeah, it was an incredible moment to watch it, and I was in there, and listen, the Paramount is made for movies like that because you feel every bit of it, but let's start where this journey sort of began and sort of the legend of Haruman and why you wanted to give it this modern-day take and sort of like, again, the genesis of the story that I know you've been working on for the better part of a decade. Wow, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a love of um, a lot of things, really. You know, uh, my, my grandfather used to... Uh, he, 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 you know, lived in Kenya, and he came, uh, you know, when he used to visit me in London, he used to tell me the stories of the Ramayana, one character in particular, Hanuman, that really captivated me. My father has this little necklace with a Hanuman pendant on it, um, and, uh, you know, it, you know, those mythologies have so many interesting parallels to them. You know, there's, you know, some of those stories of the young Hanuman, I was like, oh my God, that's like the story of Icarus. You know, and you know when you put those into context in the caste system and the idea of like, you know, the one percent against the elite, or like you know being scolded for reaching too high and aspiring too big, or I was like, you know, I can take this and and take what would be a, a Lord of the Rings type movie that's you know two hundred million dollars, you know, golden arrows and you know huge special effects, and I can distill it down and give it some real social weight you know, turn princesses into, you know, um, working girls struggling and trapped, you know, um, you know, f make a hero that um, doesn't realize he's a hero and, and, and fails and tries and fails again and then fails again. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I was like, okay, this is an anthem for underdogs and, and you know, I can fuse this mythology with my love of the action genre and, 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 and gives, give the, the audience hopefully something of substance and something different. You've touched on a lot of the stuff that I, I want to talk about today, but I want to start with this quote that I read from Jordan. It is a revenger who turns into a avenger, like an avenger, like in Marvel Cinematic Universe, this idea that a person on a singular path for something that they want can then be something more for the marginalized and the underdogs. Was that sort of a part of the DNA from the beginning? Like, how did sort of that aspect of him becoming this 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 sort of folk hero was that early in the drafts, or how did the story sort of change over these times that you kept tweaking it? Oh man, um, it was kind of from the beginning. I think you know, like I had the the first kind of image I had was like, in essence, a performing monkey. Like I went to India and I saw this monkey on the street in chains, you know, surrounded by all these people throwing money at it. And I was like, God, man, this poor thing, you know? And I was like, maybe we can personify that with this hero that's literally in this, you know, the sweaty armpit of this, you know, underground wrestling ring getting absolutely pummeled because he has no respect for himself. You know, he's hurting. Um, and I was like, you know, we, we, we need people that have gone through trauma to lift us up, you know, inspire us. There's a quote that my dear friend Joe, who's, you know, the producer on this, gave me very early on in the story, uh, very early on, uh, I think when we were doing a, a movie about a mathematician called Ramanujan. And it's, it's, it's called The Pain Will Leave You Once It's Finished Teaching You. Um, and I was like, oh, I need that. I mean, I'm, I, I mean, this process has been that for me. I'm still hurting, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, I was like, you know, we, we can take that concept and, and put it in there. And, 
you know, uh, there's things I wanted to bring to light, you know, to an audience that never really, you know, would access this type of stuff, like the Hijra community in India, you know, the people that are pushed to the phrase and the edges, you know, swept, swept to the side. Um, and I was like, okay, you know, I, I love these movies that have training montages and a Mr. Miyagi type character. And I was like, I'm going to make my Mr. Miyagi a Hijra, you know, a soulful Hijra, you know, that has this duality to their identity. And I'm going to pull from parts of the mythology and the culture, you know, uh, you know, and, and really it's a revenge film about faith, you know, and how faith can be a beautiful teacher, you know, for the uneducated, a kid that grew up in a forest, the mother can inspire a child with stories, iconography, you know, it capture their imagination, but at the same time, faith can be weaponized. Faith can be monetized. And you see that in the op opposing end, you know, and it's, you know, personally for me, it's like, you know, this is, I, ho I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but, you know, for me, Hinduism is a, a beautiful philosophy, you know, and, and, and it's the kind of like the faith aspect, you know, and, and what's going on in India. You know, it's so we, we, we touch on all of these things and, and try and give a voice to the voiceless, really. Yeah, you don't pull any punches with this. Um, one of the things I, I really noticed is there's a lot of parallels between your story, the story of making this movie, and then the actual events within the film. And the one I think is most, um, I think, prescient is this idea that you keep having to go against these bad odds, like bad things happen and things didn't go right. Like the idea that this movie almost went away yeah. because of COVID and because of circumstances, I'd love for you to sort of expand with how you had to be the underdog even in getting this made, getting yeah. this to the finish line. And it took a little bit of a lifeline at the end so that folks could then see it last night at the Paramount. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it started from the, you know, the script, you know, I, I, I didn't even know that I was going to write the script. And then, my, you know, uh, my dear co-writer Paul's like, you know, I need you to do it. So I reluctantly started writing the script with him. And then, you know, I sent the film to Neil Blomkamp and we started talking uh, and he's a dear friend. And then he's like, you know, I haven't even been to India, man. And you have this in your brain. You're talking about it like it's a song. You have every note down in your brain. You need to do this. And I was like, I can't do it, man. I, I mean, I mean, like, look at me. And he's like, no, you, you, you're going to do it. And and I was like, OK. Uh, so I reluctantly got nudged into the director's seat. And then, you know, everyone's trying to find a neat comp for movies in the industry. So they're like, what is it? Is it like? John Wick, is it like Kill Bill? And I'm like, no, it's just kind of what exists between these two big ears, you know? And it, it's, it's not, it's, there is no comp, you know? It's, it's, that's why I'm making it, you know? And that's why I'm cramming so much into it because people like me, we don't get that opportunity to touch on these things. So I, I injected it all in there. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's a dense cake, but, you know, we started off, I, I had this incredible DP, uh, and we went to India to do this huge scout. Um, and then, you know, I, COVID hit. I was in the biggest slum in India. I think uh, Trump had kind of labeled it the China virus. And I had a Korean DP at the time. And all the children had phones in the slums. And they were pointing to dear Jiong, like, COVID, COVID, COVID. And we were like, oh, my God, this thing is r real. You know, and, and I got out on the last flight, or the last seat of the last flight out of Mumbai. It was crazy, like, eh. it was like 28 days later, all the rickshaws, all the traffic had gone. The beautiful thing was the smog had lifted, so you could actually see this beautiful sky. Um, but the film basically died, and um, then again, Joe Thomas, my producer, we, I was like, we cannot let this die, like, we cannot let this die. We've, I've spent years and years and years sacrificing so many projects to write this thing. And he's like, okay, look, I know a guy who has this studio in Indonesia. Um, and I'm like, I've never been. And he's like, you know, it's called Batam. And, and, and you know, we blagged to our financiers. You know, I'd never been there. I was like, this is the best place to do this. Like, it's going to be bloody incredible. It looks exactly like India. They have, I didn't know anything. And um, we got there and it was chaos, you know, like it was, you know, it, the studio hadn't really done stuff like this, but there, were, there was so much goodwill there. And, you know, uh, we got there, we started, lo I lost my production designer um, because she, you know, she had fears of COVID. Uh, and, and so I'm there about to start production with the production designer and Pawas was the kind of meant to be like the co-production designer that was basically the facilitator 
of her vision to the locals and you know he'd worked there before and I was like Pawas tomorrow I want you to show me what's in your brain because I I'm always trying to like bring out the best in people and I can see he's he had a lot more to offer and he came in with this deck and I was like you got the job and and he just totally ran with it and we started doing this and during that time a lot of the cast that I'd cast the border started closing so you know everyone from the tailor to the gaffer to the accountant they you see throughout this film we didn't have enough stunt men so in those final sequences I'm killing the same eight guys again and again and again and you start to see the wigs and the mark some one of them looks like the Indonesian Santa Claus by the end of it like just to make him look different but it, you know in that big restaurant fight I had I think I had, was it two breakaway tables or three? Or two? I had two breakaway tables, so I do this insane, and you know, the action choreographers do a lot of cutting, and, and the first thing I wanted to do was I was like, let's try and flow with it. So we do this intense sequence, you know, which is exhausting physically, I'm covered in blood, broken hand, and then I'd throw a dude onto this table, and then Someone will call cut, and then we're on our hands and knees trying to find the balsa wood, and we're gluing the pieces together for the next take, literally. And, um, you know, uh, my dear gaffer, Yudi, our local gaffer, he passed away of a heart attack mid-shoot, and that totally ripped a hole through our chest. You know, our first first AD left the island because, you know, it was so pandemonious at the beginning, so we didn't have a first AD for a bit. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, there's so much I could, I could go on and on about, but you know, this was a process of like sheer willpower and ferocity, like the film. And we just had to pivot and adapt every single day. I had a really, really crisp plan, but I think I'm not really a technical actor. I, I'm really instinctual. So that kind of applies to my process on set. So we did this huge action sequence we planned out in the street and the day before, the, the street was closed due to COVID. So we're like, okay, let's shoot it around the side of the hotel. You know, we'd go into the bathroom sequence and all of the stuff was brass and terribly made because they didn't have enough time. So I was like, okay, we're going to stop for six hours of today. We're going to paint. And we painted. And then I started the bathroom fight for the last six hours of the day. Then I broke my hand the next day. And then, you know, we were going to be grounded again. And Am I rambling? Am I rambling? Is this, I'm, is this I'm really much? just, I'm just like, how sorry, are you sorry. here? Yeah, like, I'm I, thinking to myself, I, like, how are you alive? How are you, like, breathing? And do you need yeah. to take a nap? <laughs> I need to take a nap. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, two weeks before, I broke my foot, and that was bad. And then, you know, the financier called us, telling us we're going to shut down the production, like, a couple weeks, because of so many things were just so chaotic and, you know... The, the heavyweight producers couldn't come in because of COVID and various reasons. So they were like, what the hell is going on out there? Uh, it's going, so he, the finance accord and said, I'm, I'm shutting you down. And all of my agents gave me the kind of, don't worry, you haven't failed. Just come home with your head held high. And I'm like, nope, no way. And they're like, just, just come home. And I got on the phone with him and I gave him this brave heart speech about, you know, like the 450 souls that have a, have a job and have a purpose during this really, really bleak fucking time. And I said, you know, give me 48 hours. And I went on a Zoom call. It was a 17 hour Zoom call. And we went through every line item and I learned a lot that day. <laughs> like I was, we were cutting down makeup brushes. Like you got eight makeup brushes, make it four. How many bicycles? Okay, two bicycles. The balsa wood tables, we only got two, that was my fault. So, you know, some of, some of those things. Um, so that was one of the issues, you know, uh, the rickshaw didn't come in in time, so it kept breaking down. And but you kept doing it. We kept, kept doing it. Yeah. And it I could go on and on. Yeah. No, I mean, the thing I'll say to this is that's, I think, sort of the lesson of it is that um, every movie set, like when they do the ones from back in, like, that's Sundance movie making. Yeah. Like, like, none of those guys knew what was going. Mother of Invention is, this is not working today. They called them Jaws boat flaws because the shark yeah. didn't work and we got, you know, yeah. and I think this is a testament to that. Um, it's crazy that you said your production designer, you lost right before this because 
the 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 world that's around Monkey Man is so like I could taste it, I could feel it, I could know exactly what it was just by watching it, and I know that that's through conversations with costuming and production design and your DP, and to know that you had moving pieces outside of that. So what did you sort of tell them so that they could get inside your head to put this world around this character and to make it feel as fleshed out as it did? What was sort of the direction or was it just make it as good as India? I don't know, you know? I know, I was kind of over every detail, you know, like when that, uh, I kind of drew the first incarnation of the monkey mask and we got that in and it didn't arrive how I wanted it and one of the guys was pinching the middle and I was like, oh, that's really amazing. Why don't we stitch the middle in? Then I got a pair of scissors and started cutting into the hair and waxing it and like putting stitches in it. And you know, the Hydra's dresses, you know, that they come in and spin. Like I just wanted this kind of Sufi moment, you know, of like, I wanted it, that sequence in the restaurant to be like a, a brutal like ballet, you know? Uh, there's this amazing Korean film called Man From Nowhere and the Koreans, they drop like really beautiful, like melancholic music over the most insane violence. And I was like, you know, I want to elicit the mother. So, you know, I was, I was listening to the soundtrack of um, um, Babel and Gustavo's like strings. And we got this guy, George, to come in and do this. Like, you know, I was like, I don't want lots of instruments. I want a man playing an instrument. I want him to solo like I'm soloing. Um, you know, and you know, the whole thing was about juxtaposition, contrast, you know, hot, cold, like noisy, absolute vacuums, you know, um, you know, and the, the, you know, we're pulling from, you know, the action film tropes, you know, you look at Bruce Lee and Game of Death or The Raid or the Judge Dredd stuff, it's always about working your way up to the big boss. And I was like, okay, this is the caste system. That's why I wanted to talk about the caste system with action. We're going to start in the in a club called Kings. And we're gonna start with the poor, the slaves at the bottom in this windowless kitchen and, and surrounded by steam and woks and heat. And then we're gonna go up to the land of the Kings. And he's gonna conquer that and he's gonna bring down those tapestries of those oppressive Maharajas and the opulence of it all, you know, with the help of his band of outsiders. And then he's gonna meet a man-made God. And he's gonna challenge that God. And then, spoiler alert, heaven. Um, well, I mean, yeah. I don't know about that. I want to see Monkey Man, too. So uh -huh. I don't know if he made it to heaven. <laughs> I'm going to say that he's coming back. Uh, listen, you said John Wick. They do that all the time. The <laughs> They do. The other thing that I think is really interesting is the cast that you put in this, um, from Charlotte to um, the folks from, I know you have one of your co-stars from Hotel Mumbai, along with your producers. Fitting out this cast with you because it's a little bit different when you're a debut director because they're taking faith with you as much as you're taking faith with them. So how did you assemble this cast? Because I think that there's a lot of people that would be like, ah, oh, Dev's a good guy, let me just go kick it on set. But you had to have people that would be able to deal with the breakaway tables uh, not working and the fact that y'all are shooting in Indonesia in the middle of COVID. So. What was that sort of selection process to sort of build your Avengers around yourself in this? Yeah, I mean, I think it was really just uh, appealing to people I loved, people that I thought are insanely talented and sometimes, you know, especially in the Indian terms, overlooked, you know, because maybe their skin's too dark or they don't fit into that perfect Bollywood mold. And I was like, you know, we, we you know, I, I, we had this experience with Slumdog, you know, um, and, Vipin, you know, I, I did a film, Vipin, who plays Alpha, you know, you know, immediately I had him in mind for that role because he is just so, he's a deep well of, of, of soulful goodness and emotion. And, you know, he, he reminded me, he's like the Indian, like Forrest Whitaker or something, you know, he's just brilliant. And then I, I wrote the role for Pito Bash, who plays Alfonso, who's, you know, I always just, I could see us, you know, like, you know, this odd couple uh, going through the film and it was a joy writing his lines. Shobita came in and auditioned for me and, and again, she had this, she's you know, absolutely stunning and captivating, but she, can, she holds pain so well. Um, uh, and you know, even though she's a woman who's trapped, I wanted her to be in charge 
in the scenario. So whenever we're in a scene, she, she actually holds the confidence and the weight. You know, she's not a damsel that's looking for a guy to save her. She's like, you know, if this is, if you can't handle this stuff, it's not the place to work, so get your shit together. You know, um, and you know, I, I, I didn't want to save her. She saves me in the movie. Um, and then Charlto, uh, uh, you know, he came in, you know, everyone had to quarantine for two weeks on this island. So even if they had like a scene, they had to sit in their room for two weeks before they could come out and then do the scene and leave. So it was, you know, they really came for the love of it. And I'm deeply, deeply grateful to these, these people. And Charlto is a guy that, you know, like in District 9, I gave him a, an outline and we talked about elements and I just let him riff. So some of the lines, there's so much on the cutting room floor, you know, you could do a whole like, Dave Chappelle special with like Charlto's like off cuts. He's, he's brilliant. Um, but uh, all of the cast, uh, really, they're, they're fantastic. Yeah. I also really want to talk about the fact that, you know, you starred in this, you produced it, you wrote it. You oh, sorry, could I say one thing, Jacqueline? Yes. Sorry to jump on you. No, no. Also, please. you know, the Hijras, you know, I really wanted to get real, you know, m members of the LGBTQ plus community. And so we, in Batam and Indonesia before the borders closed, we sent out like, you know, and we got all these people from TikTok coming in and, and stuff and never acted before those guys. They came in first time on a film set and they were absolutely phenomenal. They were doing stunt training and wearing all these amazing costumes. And that was the first pre-shoot day and just being around these guys and, and what the story meant to them and being represented in a film like this and talked about ph philosophically, they, they loved it and that set off the kind of nature of the crew, like we're gonna have chaos, but we're gonna have like vibrant people around and a lot of laughter. Sorry to jump on you. But. No, I really am glad you put that up because I think it's a perfect illustration of the type of representation you can even have within representation because this is not just a story about, you know, South Asian or Indian culture. There's so many shades within that that we don't get to see, the caste system. And, and again, this LGBTQ representation you mentioned. The thing I wanted to talk about is all the jobs you had on this, because as many people as you hired, you hired yourself four times. So um, that's, seriously. Um, how hard is that, though, on a debut film? I'm sure there's days that Dev the director hated Dev the writer, and there's days that Dev the actor hated everybody else. Um, like, what was, what was the, the part that was most daunting? Or was it better to be doing all of them together? It might have been a more freeing opportunity. Um. <laughs> Uh, you had to like curse yourself when you're like, I gotta bite this dude's nose. Sorry, spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, yeah, it's it's. I basically didn't watch myself in it, um, you know. So we would do scenes, and I would really rely on the actors. You know, I would run it as an actor with them, get a couple of takes, and get the first like raw performance, and then. We, we had this conversation, well, I would do like one-on-one -on -one rehearsals with each of them, so we were really tuned in on the scene, and then I would bring a monitor and then read the lines, but I'd be like looking at the monitor to make sure they're framed right, and I, then I'll just talk to them, so it's a very schizophrenic process, and then right at the end of the day, I would, like the last 30 minutes, I'd just drill my stuff, and I'd lean on the DP, I'd lean on the, my dear friend Ruggle, who came in, uh, who's like my best friend who, who started off as an assistant on Marigold Hotel and Judy Dench and, and me fought over him for the sequel. You know, he's this beautiful, lovely gay Indian guy that knocked on our trailer with this big fanny pack and became my best friend. And he, he's a lover of Indian classical music and everything. You know, I listen to hip hop and rap and all that. And, you know, so some of those things, you know, when he introduced me to Indian classical, I was like, I want to put this dying art form in the, in the movie. I want to revitalize it, um, but uh, yeah, it was um, it was a feeling more than anything, you know. I mean, what would you say was the most difficult day? I mean, it sounds like there was a few of them, but if the, looking back on it, the one that you were most proud of the reaction you got from folks last night that you that you got to see it on screen. Uh, the, what the, the most difficult day that last night when you got to see yeah. folks see it, they were like cheering for it, or the day that you're like, okay, that was worth it. It was worth all that time. Yeah. It was worth all that effort. That that bathroom fight was a particularly hard one, um, you know, because obviously we turned up to the set and it was not good, so we lost six hours of a day, which is half of a day on a three day shoot, which is huge. Um, I broke my hand straight away and. Uh, it was it blew up like an elephant's hand and we carried on shooting and it's like i don't know if you've ever had a boxer's fracture but it flicks the nerves so the, the pain
pain was shooting up my ear. Um, but, you know, you, you try and lead by example and the crew just clicks in and, you know, I'm facing sloshing in this water, you know, you're soaked. When your underwear gets soaked and you're in wet underwear the whole bloody day and you're trying to be a confident director covered in, like, <laughs> blood and, you know, you're getting, you know, pink eye because all, all the guys I, were like, don't bring your shoes from the, the general bathrooms in. No one cared. They're coming in, there's chewing gum and, like, and, you know, it was... It was painful, and again, we were going to be shut down because a hand got broken, and we went on YouTube and found this, found this, you know, hospital that would have us, and we found a, there was like a cheap medical jet, so we didn't have to break the insurance COVID bubble. <laughs> so we, after shooting that night, I got on a jet, and I was so exhausted. It was like the middle of shoot. Uh, I go under, they put a screw in, and the doctor's like, you know, do not you know, you cannot put any weight on this. You cannot do anything with this hand because there's a nail in there. And if it bends, you're never going to be able to move your hand again because it's like pulling a bent nail out of wood. You're just going to wreck the wood. And we care. went straight back in the bathroom. And, you know, I'm throwing myself at this window <laughs> and bouncing off it. And I tore my shoulder. And, and uh, it, was, it was painful. Um, I mean, I would uh, think, you know what? Painful. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. But it's again. a rite of passage. <laughs> it's a rite of passage. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? But um, it's that was mad. Um, I mean, guys, there's there's so many. That tuk tuk, like I don't know if you were there yesterday. That thing couldn't get past around about like eight to ten miles per hour. And you know, I had this whole thing of like I wanted it to be like the poor man's Batmobile. You know, <laughs> that Alfonso spent his life putting all his earnings into pimping out. You know, and. Um, it showed up and it wasn't, uh, it was a bit Benny Hill more than Batman. Um, so to try and create pace in that sequence, I was like, what do we do? So we got these cheap drones and we just shot them down the road to create these like POV shots that kind of elicited speed. Uh, and the rest was up to Peter Bash and myself to just, you know, be screaming the hell out of it. But um, you sold it. Yeah. You sold it. So that was mad. There was so much. Yeah. I want to talk about the action because the placement that you have with the camera is something that I think folks that are um, fans of the genre are really going to key in on because you don't let the camera really live in one place with it. At certain times, it's observing the action. At other times, it's literally in it where it feels like you know it's getting the violence as much as you are. In other moments, it feels like maybe this is your you know your co-star and they're literally like right up up against you. How did you sort of come and distill the language of how you wanted to place the camera? Were you really sort of looking at inspiration? or did you want to have the movie have its own sort of dialogue when it came to the action sequences and how did you figure all that out? I think it's um, I was tr just trying to get as close to the feeling as I get uh, being an actor, you know, and I just wanted to be, I, I, I did martial arts as a kid for a long time and I, I've been to many a competition doing Taekwondo getting my ass absolutely whooped, you know, and the feeling of like, what feels like your brain's shaking, you know, like inside your skull, that feeling. And Sharon has this amazing, you know, camera equipment that he's kind of made. He calls it the swing shift, which has got these rubber bands and the lens. It, you know, you can kind of wobble it and it warps the image. And I was like, what if we like tape some stuff around it and put these little things so you can punch the camera and it kind of has this, it wobbles and like distorts. So you get this kind of like concussion type feeling. Otherwise, you get these very flat, like, dish, dish, dish to cameras, and it's just flat, like a hand doing, like, the old movies. And I was like, no, we need to vibrate with it. And then, you know, very early on in the wrestling, we are shooting it like this, and I was like, this doesn't feel like what it would feel like for him. So let's... So I got one of the camera operators to kind of get in underneath, and he was moving with the guys in and out. And then we started getting even more crazy. So a punch would whip you to Charlto, Tiger. He would do his line, then would whip back in. It would go up to the audience, get knocked out. And I was like, let's just change point of view. So we're watching him, and then we're him. And then he gets punched back in. And um, you know, while, we were, while I was doing stunts, so I'd wake up super early in the morning you know, to go in and do stunt training. And you know, we didn't have any like weights or anything on the island. So I was built on sweet potatoes and, and these rubber band things that they had. So I was doing these crazy rubber band things and I was working with these, stunt, I got so close with the stunt team and Brahim, oh my God, he was, a, you know, we couldn't get the John Wick guys, you know, the borders closed and we found him on YouTube 
and he came down, and he was a beast. And his guy, Stephen, who kind of like shoots on a little like Canon, like, photo, like you know, camera, he was shooting like the pre-visits. And he also is a brilliant stuntman. And so I, I, I went to Sharon and I said, you know, I think we should make Stephen an operator. And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, no, we, we, he, we, need, we need a ninja, you know, like operating this thing. And like, this shouldn't be me versus the bad guy. It should be three of us dancing together. So once we activated Steven, you know, we had Sharon's like overall aesthetics and like you would go through the shots and you know, there were so many cuts in it and I was like, how can we string together the sequence? And they're like, you're gonna kill yourself. Just give yourself leeway. And I'm like, no, let's try and string together longer sections. And Steven, when I would do a hit, he would know when to shake, when to whip, when to come down. And he was moving in tandem with us, you know? So we were, you know, it was a beautiful symbiosis that we had going. Another thing, if you look at the action of the film, is it's not a gun-heavy picture. I mean, there's obviously a lot of gun sequences in there, but there's actually a lot more knife work, which I think is both more dangerous, but also it feels so much more um, violent yeah. when, when everything happens. Um, how early was the decision to really lean in to the knife work? And then also, there's a lot of improvised, I would say, weapons in this one because you film in kitchens and whatever. I want to know when the fireworks came into display because <laughs> I think that is a very yeah. particular action sort of element element that I haven't really seen used that way in an action movie before. Wow. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't like guns. So I, um, I was like, you know, I'm going to have a guy fixated on using a gun and then it's going to go terribly, terribly wrong. Um, uh, and, you know, that whole bathroom sequence is three guys, one gun, horribly, you know, a toilet that seen better days. And, I, and then I choreographed, you know, and wrote that scene. Um, around it, um, but the, there's a term in, 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 the, in India that I found that they used to use a lot in Islam, it's called jugad, and jugad is like, you know, by any means necessary, it's resourcefulness, so it's like, you've got a plastic bag, you can use it to go fishing, you can cover the, the leaking roof in your slum, you can, you know, twist the four corners and make it a hat, you know, you can do many things with it, and I was like, this guy needs to have jugad, so that resourcefulness, and I told the crew, that was what I put on the whiteboard. I was like, we're gonna have Jugard as a crew. So if the rickshaw doesn't work, we're gonna be resourceful. You know, if we don't have the actors, Joe, you're gonna be an actor, you know? Um, and Wait, was Joe an actor? He, he was in it, he was uh -huh. in it. There's a great deleted scene of him. But, um, um, it, you know, that was, the knife stuff was something that I wanted to play with a lot. And, you know, the fireworks, so the film takes place in the festival of Diwali at the end you know, which is the festival of light in the Hindu calendar. And I wanted to just tip my hat to, the, you know, they, it's fireworks, it's a festival of fireworks. And I was like, what would a guy do, you know, going into this huge compound to face a hundred men alone uh, and not use a gun? You know, well, the first thing you do is maybe make some little improvised fireworks and okay, one's gonna go in a mouth, one's gonna let off and we're gonna do some things with it. Um, and yeah, I just love that texture of this him you know, in his little, you know, tinkering away, making this stuff. A lot of directors, especially with action, can approach it in a couple of different ways. They can approach it to where on the script it says, amazing, epic action sequence, and then they keep writing. <laughs> and then there's directors where they detail it out with words exactly what's gonna be happening. Other folks uh, approach it with storyboards. Um, what was the language for you and how much of that was in the pre-production and how much of that was improvised once y'all got on set? It's really in the script. Yeah, you know, I, I drove everyone around me crazy. I was, you know, any Airbnb I was in, I was breaking, you know, like uh, <laughs> all the kitchen bits, you know, the doors and stuff, trying to figure out how to, you know, you know, oh, you can catch a hand in a kettle, we can do that. And like, you know, just really tapping into the most sadistic part of my brain. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's all in the script. And then we would get to the stage and Brahim did a masterful job of, putting together these sequences and then I'm like, wait a minute, I can do a better kick. So why don't we try this? Or why don't we have another guy run in? Um, and so we just kept trying to up it um, until you know we had no time and just had to shoot it. Um, you've been on movie sets since you were a teenager. Shout out to Skins, um, but yeah. 
<laughs> You've been directed by some incredible directors, including Neil and uh, Danny Boyle. I mean, there's just a ton of folks that you've worked with over the years. Um, who would you say was some of the more influential folks that you've worked with that helped you when you were first setting foot on set that day? You were thinking back to either the good or bad lessons that you had learned from them being an actor on their set. As you can tell, like I'm really quite, uh, I don't have good control of my limbs. I'm this like gangly, like, you know, and when I, the first day I auditioned for Danny Ball, um, for Slumdog, you know, he kind of, I came in and, you know, there wasn't like the older actors. So, I mean, they were, they were all older, the characters, and he aged them down when we got cast. But he's like, you know, to be a leading man, you have to be still, you know, and you, you have to let the audience enter you from your eyes. And I never understood that at the beginning. I was like, what do you mean? I should be trying to do everything I can, make them laugh and show every kind of thing I can do. And he's like, you have to be still. And that was the most crucial piece of advice that I took forward and a lot of, my experience with Danny has got, you know, I tip my hat to him with a little wallet passing sequence, you know. Um, that was the one thing, you know, I went and shot after we shot the movie because I couldn't get to India. So when the borders opened, I just bought my own Sony A7 camera and we went and shot it ourselves and, and did that, you know. Um, then, you know, um, I worked with this director called David Lowry on this film called Green Knight and David is like this, like, you know, he's just this guy that's like in tune with nature. Like every piece of costume is like, you know, vegan leather and, you know, and I wanted to go from this like ferocious, like the middle of the film to be this like insane nonstop, like feast of action to then just like, we're gonna do stuff like tip our hat to embrace the serpent. We're gonna do, we're gonna do some of those things and talk about the philosophy of the culture, talk about trauma uh, and, and, you know, all of that stuff and ancestry and, and then, you know, there was another director called Garth Davis, uh, uh, who I did a film called Lion with. And Garth is just like... Academy nominated performance yeah. in a film Yeah, and Garth is like a beautiful, beautiful soul. You know, when I was in A Real Pickle, he came in and watched it and was the guy that gave me these notes. And, um, and really, you know, just... I was like, you know, I want to create something super violent, but I, I want it to really have a lot of heart and like... And, and, and he just helped me lean into that, you know, um, so yeah. Uh, it is really violent, like, dude, <laughs> yeah. like, I, I was like, this is not what I would have expected from, like, <laughs> you're dark, dude. Um, <laughs> For, like the, the the there's a knife sequence in this that will give people nightmares in the best way possible, and I I do have to say that is absolutely great. But in addition to all the violence and every bit of the action, there's a lot that's being said about India, and there's a lot that's being said about the political climate there, the caste system, and all of that takes a very sort of like fearless director to to really put that out there the way that you did in this movie. Um, I will just ask you: Was there any questions for you about how you wanted to approach that because there's different directors where you don't have to maybe go as hard as you did as far as like making a statement about the way things are and I think the film is obviously richer for it but it's got to be also a gut check moment too because you you want to know how it's going to be received yeah I mean the film was like born from like extreme rage inside myself the angriest I'd ever felt I was in India in 2012 you know, th they call it the Delhi bus rape, you know, but I, 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 you know, it was Nirbhaya, this beautiful soul, you know, this, 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 this ch child of, uh, of India, you know, that went through the most horrific thing that kind of crippled the country. Um, you know, sh you know it, was a, it was a young girl that got gang raped on a bus and, and the most horrible things you can imagine happened to this individual. And, and I was there at the time um, I was in a relationship with my, my co-star at the time in Slumdog and it, you know, we got a cannon shot through the center of our chest with it. And, um, that's when I was like, you know, oh my God, like, you know, I, I couldn't, if, if, if something so terrible was to happen to someone I love so fucking dearly and, you know, I, you know, I went to India a lot and I did feel there was a lot of angst in the youth. There is a lot of stifling, there's a stifling feeling. People want to break free. They want to while out, you know, you know, when you got, you know, this kind of huge oppressive foot on your throat, 
It's like, and you know, and these men watch these action movies out there, you know, and I'm like, we need to educate them with heroes that like are fighting for what's right and what's good, you know? Um, so that's, that happened, you know? Um, and so, you know, that's where s some of this stuff was born, you know? Uh, and from there, you know, I wanted to talk about the politics of the country in a way um, and, and, and put, put it all in there. So uh, that, that's where some of those threads started coming in, you know? And again, they make the film that much more powerful because by the time you get to the end, you feel like you're fighting for something bigger than what he is. And a lot of the people that you're fighting for um, fight along with them. I also really wanted you to discuss the fact that nobody rescues anybody in this one. There's a, there's a tendency to feel like, okay, he's the Robin Hood, so he's saving these meek people who are not able to save themselves. There was, I think, a very deliberate point of yours to make sure nobody needed saving, yeah. except for maybe him. I, I, I got <laughs> uh, saved a lot. Yeah, um, so talk about that and how you made sure those moments felt organic within the script, because that takes a very careful, I think, uh, pacing and making sure that all these characters feel very fleshed out so they just don't show up in, in certain moments. So yeah, how did you approach that to make sure, again, nobody needed saving? I think it was like, the way I read the mythology was like, you know, when you look into it, like Hanuman and his band of outsiders waged this mighty war to save this princess in Lanka and his tail got set on fire and he, you know, set this whole empire alight with his tail. So I was pulling from all of these things, the gas canister and building, you know, burning down this empire of kings and whatnot. But I, I, I always thought, you know, that this was going to be about the outsiders banding together, you know, and, and propping each other up, you know. Um, you don't understand your true potential and it takes other people to bring that out of you, you know, and someone who's battled with, you know, low, low self-esteem and lack of belief throughout his career, you know, I've had to lean on the people that uh, love me dearly to, to see, see something in me that I don't. And that happened every day on this set, you know? Um, and so that was the story of this film. You know, it's, it's about the underdogs you know, challenging, you know, there's this word in India they call the untouchables, which are like the cast that, you know, you don't even go near. But for me, I was like, the true untouchables are those guys that the feet, their feet don't even touch the ground. They're in these air conditioned cocoons and these nice Rolls Royces listening to, as the book White Tiger says, Enya, you know, and you're like, you, you, you know, the, the, you know this, this kid, if I wrote this, this guy, this character from where he came from and, you know, sleeping surrounded by all these men, how would he even possibly get near this God, you know, this, this man-made God, you know? Um, so, you know, that was, they're the true untouchables to me, you know? Um, so, yeah. Uh, and I think Monkey Man touches them a lot in this. I don't want to, like, spoil the final act, but he... he touches <laughs> in a very violent way. Yeah. Um, your collaborators in this, you mentioned Joe, who worked with you on The Man from Infinity and Hotel Mumbai, and also with what Monkey Paw did. I think with all the jobs that you were doing on set, having good people behind you in the producer's chair is so vital because sometimes they have to talk you off the ledge, sometimes <laughs> they have to hype you up. Um, talk about those two with Jordan and Joe and how their collaboration on this made one, the project happened, but more importantly, the greatness that we got to see on screen. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, when you go on an island away from your son for nine months, that's Joe, you know, that's a lot. Um, and he put his, um, he put his soul in, he's sitting there, so I'm not gonna get emotional, whoever, he, uh, you know, I, he put everything into this with me. I'm this hyperactive, like, you know, energizer bunny flicking around, and I, you know, it's like Borg and McEnroe in a way. Um, so J Joe was the steady, you know, there. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I, I'm kind of like, you know, like, like in, an Indian meal, you know, everyone sits around the table, we're all, you know, pulling from the, I, that's the way I write, that's the way I do stuff. And I'm, you know, in an edit room, I'm dragging loads of people in. I, do, I try and keep it open because I want people to interrogate it and prod it and pull it and, you know, and then the film for some reasons or another uh, got dropped by Netflix and 
we were facing oblivion. And then, you know, I'm doing this tiny low budget film in Yorkshire and I get a call from uh, my lovely agents, uh, Franklin Latt and Dan Ramanau uh, and, and Rogue Sutherland at CAA. And they're like, um, hey, jo have you heard of this guy, Jordan Peele? And I was like, are you kidding me? They go, yeah, he, he watched your film and I think he liked it. And I was like, oh, cool. And they're like, he wants to talk to you. And I'm like, wow, wow. And they're like, now. And I was like, ah! And, uh, you know, I'd literally been, I think I did a scene where I was, like, chasing sheep around a paddock in the day. And then, like, the, in the evening, I'm on a Zoom with fucking Jordan Peele. Um, and Jordan, he knew that I'd gone through a lot of pain. And the first thing he said was, tell me what you've gone through. I want to hear it. And it was the first time. It was like a therapy session. He, he sat, this huge Goliath in the industry, and he listened to me like, you guys are fucking rambling. Just as rambling away. Um, and, you know, he said, you know, for people that look like us and, and his mission in his company is to, to, to give voice to the voiceless, is to, 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 you know, bend genre. And that's what I wanted to do is I wanted to do a, a little salt bay, but with spice on, on, on the action genre. I wanted to inject it with culture and, and philosophy. And he got every touchstone every hat that I tipped to the movies and filmmakers that I liked he was like that's that and um he basically you know this thing got brushed under the rug he picked it up he took the dust off it and he put it back on the mantelpiece and with his weight Universal came in and you know it was like you know this it was getting you know all of a sudden getting into an Ivy League college and 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 the last run of this was like Hollywood shit, man. I was like, oh my God, we were there, you know, taping, you know, gluing tables together. And now we're here with Jordan and his crew and at Universal. Um, so it was like, um, it was like that scene in Pretty Woman, you know, where you go back in the shop and you, with the credit card. <laughs> and all of the, there were so many haters in this. And I was like, uh, it felt like that moment for me. I was Julia Roberts with, <laughs> drenched in blood, uh, with a knife. <laughs> um, oh, I love that so much. Yeah. Uh, well, that brings me to my, my next last question, which is, this is going to get, um, as you mentioned, it started at a streamer, and it's going to get a box office release, theaters, April 5th, everyone. Yeah, go, go check it out. <laughs> what you experienced last night in the Paramount is going to be repeated across in theaters throughout the United States, not even in a remotely small release. Have you really grasped that, like how big this is gonna be and that audiences are gonna to get to see it in this way? And is there anybody in particular that you're hoping gets to see the film that you're like, okay, I would love to know what they think about it. Or more importantly, maybe I wanna be in the room um, at this, you know, this screening at AMC. I don't know, what, what are you looking forward to when the audiences sort of like get a chance to see it on April 5th? Um. Man, I just, you know, as a, as, a, as a real, like, humble fan of the genre, you know, like, I, I sometimes, like, see these films that are being churned out by the system that just kind of abuse it, you know, to make a quick buck. It's mindless fucking fodder. And, 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 and I, I think it does an injustice to the genre, you know. Having trained with these stunt guys, they, they are artists. They are, you know, they they put their bodies on the line day in, day out. And, you know, the, the, the greatest catharsis is going into a dark room where we're all equal, you know. Um, you know, uh, race, creed, uh, sexuality means nothing. And you're put in this room and you're transported to something and you get to experience things that, you, you get to live the emotions that you don't want to express in life. And I was like, okay, this is what I want to touch on here, you know. But I, I just... There was a guy that came up to me yesterday, uh, an Indian man, an uh, American Indian guy, and he goes, I'm, I'm jealous of my, my 14 year old son. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you know, I, he's finally got someone to, 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 to look up to in this space. And I never had that. And I just, I was about to cry. And I was like, you know, I remember sneaking through the banister way past my bedtime and watching Bruce Lee and being absolutely captivated by this man who had kind of skin like mine next day my whole room was plastered with bruce lee posters you know then i got you know was watching samo jet lee you know donnie Yen, like jackie like all of those guys and my you know then into korean cinema and i was like you know it's just a wonderful place to exist in this industry right now where we get to go and put our 
stories, our history, our ancestry into, uh, you know, this is my humble addition to the genre, you know? And I hope, you know, like Slumdog did, it opens the door and it allows a lot of other cultures to come in and put their spin on it and, and, and do things. Um, um, I, I don't know if I answered No, that I think you well. did. You yeah, definitely yeah, did. Yeah. No, listen, I'm, I'm glad that you, you, made it, you made it to this point because we got to see it. Folks are going to get to experience it. They're going to get to have the moments I did where I'm looking at it through my fingernails and like, <laughs> oh, that's gross. Oh, I can't do that. But it's an incredible story. I also want to just... Can I say one more thing, Jacqueline? Yeah. Sorry, I was just thinking about it when I was, like, I, you know, when I... Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, but, like, you know, when I was a kid, like, they, they always used to, like... I used to run away from my culture in school. Like, it wasn't cool to, to be associated with India or Indian, and, and, and I used to really run away from it. And, you know, sometimes to break the mold, you have to enter it. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'm going to go in and I'm going to... You know, I've been constantly pigeonholed as the Indian IT guy or this or that. And I'm like, no, I'm going to go in and I'm going to double down. I'm going to triple down on the culture, you know, and I'm uh, it's 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 vibrant and it can be cool. And 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 so that's that was a big part of my 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 thing with this film as well. You know, I'm glad you mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope Universal doesn't matter to me. I'm going to just make a little comment. I have had a long thing about your career. I've watched you on Skins like way back then, and I was like, I want to see what. And, and shout out to Skins. A lot of people on that show have done really great They're things, amazing. including yourself. But I had often said, I wonder when there's going to be a director that lets Dev Patel be cool and hot for an entire <laughs> runtime. Not cool and hot at the end, not cool and hot when he's doing IT, but just cool and hot and <laughs> slick all the way through. And I'm very happy to say thank you, Mr. Dev Patel, because that director was you. <laughs> Listen, you put all those shirtless scenes in that movie. There you have <laughs> that. I didn't, I didn't do it. I, you did. Uh, the last thing, sorry, I was like, I had to say it. <laughs> they know. Um, <laughs> they know. Uh, the last thing I wanted to add to this one is as, as you've sort of like put this to bed and looking towards the future, and I feel even remote to ask you this because you just finished it a week ago and you broke half of your body to do it, but... <laughs> Have you got the bug? Is this what you want to continue to do? Is this is this something that sort of sparked more into you, or now you're like, let me take a break before I move on to something else? I feel bad even asking you this because yeah. it's sort of like I just went to Vietnam and you want me to go back. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I've got some other things that I'm, I'm tinkering on, very different genres, some of them. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, we're. we're um, um, He's not going to tell me anything. Um, yeah. But how about this? Some genres that you're interested in, like, or particular types of stories that you'd be interested in exploring that are maybe outside of the action genre, it's particular people you'd maybe want to work with. Yeah. Um, oh, God, that's a huge question. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm writing a kind of like a period film that's, you know, like, I don't know, it's like David Lean meets like Revenant and, Ap and Apocalypto <laughs> set in Australia. So there's that and like, you know, some odd like sci-fi horror thing. And obviously I love action, um, but uh, you know, it's it's more about a story and a character for me than anything. I know that sounds really cliche, but um, I don't really have a trajectory. I'm just kind of like awkwardly feeling my way through it, I guess. And um, you know, uh, it's based a lot on um, my experience as a person and, and, and stuff like that. But uh, there's so many uh, actors. I mean, just throw some names out there. I mean, I'm just curious because, I mean, we've been mentally casting you in rom-coms for the better part of a decade. Yeah. So. I mean, I want to do something really <laughs> light and joyful. I'm not going to lie after this. I just want to do something super fluffy and, like, very smiley and no blood. <laughs> no blood. You know, yeah, no shitty toilets and, like, yeah, just, like, yeah, happiness. Yeah. Well... Thank you very much for Thank this. You, Thank you Jack. for chatting with me. You're I amazing. Say, oh, no. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys uh, for listening. I want to say listening. thank you to Universal and Monkey Paw and all of yes. you for watching. And I want to remind everyone, you can go see it again on April I appreciate 5th. you guys. Thank I really do. Big love. Thank you.